first episode of season 21 of Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast on the internet that selects six movies all based on a single theme. Then in each episode, we select one of those movies and provide you, the listener, with about 20 minutes of fun facts and questionably sourced history about the people in front of and behind the camera of that movie. And who are the people that work so hard to perform such an amazing feat that cost you zero dollars and zero cents? Why, it's the entire dedicated team of employees and interns here at Pick 6 Movies. But you'll mostly are going to hear only from me, Chad Cooper, and my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell. So enough with the introductions. I'm sure you'll want to know, hey, what's the theme of this new season? Well, I don't know why you came here tonight, but I got the feeling that something is right. T-Rexes to the left of me, killer robots to the right, here I am, Crichton the Middle with you. That's right, this season's theme is Crichton the Middle with you, featuring six movies written or adapted from books authored by the legendary man of many talents, Michael Crichton. Kicking off this season is Congo, a movie that Bo loves, because Bo loves any movie featuring primates. And in this movie, the primate is named Amy, and she knows sign language. And she has a magic glove translator that turns her sign language into a high-pitched robotic voice. You know, the kind you might find in a children's toy that you gift to a kid whose parents you desperately want to torture. Wait, you didn't know gorillas could learn sign language? Well, sit back as Bo introduces us to a world where we can talk with the animals, and unfortunately, they can talk back. Bo, take it away. All right, new season of Pick 6 Movies, and that means getting the lights back on at HQ, seeing what the new crop of interns has in store for us, lights, and oh my god. Amy intern. Amy good gorilla. Amy the talking ape from Congo? You're our new intern? Amy good gorilla. Amy intern. All right, so I guess we're starting with Congo this season, huh? Amy good gorilla. Congo good movie. Amy love Congo. I'm not sure that voice thing is working. Then again, maybe it's just a parlor trick of sorts. I mean, gorillas can't actually talk, can they? Oh, stupid. Amy talk. Maybe. But before we talk about the movie you came from, let's talk about whether or not a gorilla can actually talk. And to do that, we need to talk about Coco. Coco good gorilla. Amy love Coco. <laughs> Shut up, Amy. If you didn't know, Coco the gorilla was, purportedly, the most famous gorilla to possess the ability to communicate thoughts and emotions to us humans. Coco was born in captivity in the San Francisco Zoo in 1971. She was the 50th gorilla to be born in captivity, but only the first to be accepted by her mother. Turns out zoos are not the best place for primates to raise a kid. But Coco was special. Unfortunately, Coco fell victim to an illness when she was only one year old and had to be taken away from her mother and treated. It was at this time that Coco was found by Francine Patterson, also known as Penny Patterson, who was a caregiver to Coco while she was ailing. While Coco was in the San Francisco Zoo Hospital, Penny Patterson and another researcher named Charles Paternak nursed Coco back to health. It was here that Penny and Charles began their research with the aid of Coco. They began to teach her American Sign Language, or ASL. Amy no sign language. Amy good gorilla. Uh-huh. Anyways, Penny and Charles were essentially given Coco for four years to get their language study off the ground, much like the film Congo. Amy love Congo. Shut up, Amy. Much like that movie, the researchers were interested in giving the awesome power of language to a primate for no other reason than to see what a gorilla might say. Sure, there were other gains to be made about how language defines our thoughts and how a grammatical construct dictates our thinking, but a lot of it was this Dr. Doolittle idea of what would an animal say if you could understand it. While Penny and Charles worked with Coco on the initial four-year study, they were also giving Coco infant IQ tests to determine how smart Coco was, at least in terms of human intelligence. These tests generally returned scores of 70 to 90, which placed her in the range of a somewhat slow infant, but not one that was intellectually impaired. Penny would be quick to argue, also, that it's a little unfair to compare the intellect of a gorilla and a person. While our brains are similar, they are most certainly not the same. Still, Coco was moved to the Gorilla Foundation, a preserve where Penny and Charles could study her growth with language and encourage more sophisticated tests. Over time, 
Coco was said to have had the ability to form about a thousand words in ASL, which places her around the vocabulary of a three-year-old, and the ability to understand about 2,000 words of spoken English. Penny would report that Coco used signs of greater complexity, describing thoughts and emotions. And here we can detour from her language to Coco herself, who appeared to recognize herself in a mirror at the age of 19. I know that sounds basic, but remember that being able to see an image of yourself outside of yourself and say definitively, that is me, requires a degree of intellectual abstraction. That reflection is not you, but it does represent you. Most gorillas are incapable of such abstractions. And Coco also appeared to have the ability to care for other creatures. She famously had a stuffed animal. Amy lovey. Amy want lovey. You'll get nothing and like it. As I was saying, Coco had a stuffed animal that Penny hoped would foster affection in Coco, but Coco wanted the real thing. In 1983, according to her caregivers, Coco signed that she wanted a cat for Christmas. When they gave her a kitten stuffed animal, Coco refused to care for it, signing sad over and over. And so in 1984, Coco was given an actual kitten. All Ball, a name Coco picked out herself, was from a litter of abandoned kittens, a gray manx just for Coco. Observers said she treated All Ball like a baby gorilla, trying to nurse it and played with it. In the worst ending to such a sweet story, Coco's cat, All Ball, escaped the cage, ran into the street, and was run over and killed. When Penny told Coco what had happened, Coco reportedly signed, bad, sad, bad, frown, cry, and the researcher stated she heard a sound like weeping coming from Coco. Coco did have other kittens, though, and even had a potential mate for a while, a gorilla named Michael, who was planned to be Coco's boyfriend, but that was not to be. Coco never took to Michael in a romantic sense, but the two primates were friendly and affectionate. Coco seems to have indicated she considered Michael a sibling of sorts. Michael was also taught sign language, and in one horrifying, if true, exchange, seemed to indicate he recalled his mother's slaughter by poachers. When Michael died in 2000, Coco was despondent. Her pal had died, and no one was there to be a companion. Well, almost no one. Over the years, a famous talking gorilla had her share of famous admirers. She was visited by Sting of the police fame, and Fred Rogers of being a nice human fame, but she had a bit of a crush on one human in particular. In 2001, actor and comedian Robin Williams came to visit. In the time between Michael's death and her first encounter with Robin Williams, Penny said Coco didn't smile. She was depressed, just like we all are when we lose someone close. But Williams played with Coco. You can see videos on YouTube of the two of them playing and communicating with one another. In one instance, she asks Robin Williams to chase and tickle her, and so he does. And she is so clearly delighted by this, as is he. It's a remarkable exchange between a human and one of our closest cousins. And Coco outlived Robin Williams, and when she learned of his death, she expressed another bout of mourning at the loss of yet another friend. Amy said. Yeah, that's a sad one, Amy. But there were lots of wonderful stories about Coco. She appeared to understand when her birthday was approaching and would draw pictures of cakes and candles in anticipation. And Penny believed that Coco experienced time the same way that people do, or similar enough to be able to mark the passage of time with major events of symbolic value like birthdays and holidays. But back to language for a bit. The question hangs around the research Penny Patterson and her companions have done. Did Coco really understand language in a way that was more than Pavlovian? I dated someone whose dog lost their mind if you said the word pizza because it knew it was going to get some food it liked. Was Coco's use of sign language to fulfill her needs the same thing? Or was there something more, dare I say it, human going on behind Coco's eyes? Other researchers claim that Coco did what she did because she was rewarded for doing so, but never really understood the meaning of her signing, something called operant conditioning. Videos seen and evaluated by professionals could be credibly claimed to show that Coco's responses were the result of subconscious cues from her trainers, and that none of the evidence was clear enough to say with certainty that Coco could, you know, speak. Amy Smart. Amy Talk Gorilla. That's the problem, Amy. Is my use of the word talk making you respond in a similar way, or are you thoughtfully recognizing your own ability to use language? 
Penny Patterson said Coco was capable of talking about language, another higher order school of thought. When her companion Michael would sign to her, Coco might sign back, good sign, as if encouraging Michael's proper use or his accuracy in communicating. Coco seems to have been able to talk about memories and to combine signs to make new words, as when Coco combined the signs for finger and bracelet to make finger bracelet in reference to a ring she saw around someone's finger. She also seems to have been aware of mortality and her own aging. She would communicate to her trainers that they had to be more patient with her in her later life. She would sign the word old as if an excuse for her more lumbering gait as the years wore on. And then Coco would eventually die of natural causes in captivity in 2018 at the age of 46. In attendance were her new kittens, her new monkey pal Ndume, and of course, Penny Patterson. The truth is, when it comes to primate intelligence and their ability to reason and communicate based on that reason, we just don't know. It's wonderful to think so, that someday we could bridge the gap between human and primate. I just don't know what we would say to them. You could start with I'm sorry. Shut up, Amy! Stupid monkey. But while the veracity of guerrilla communication can be debated, one thing that is unassailably true is that Congo is not a very good movie. In theory, though, it should be. It has all the makings of a very good adventure. There's the fascinating concept of communication with a gorilla. There's an adventure into the heart of Africa, mysterious ruins, a ferocious enemy made up of legendary creatures, and yet the result is a big pile of poo. Amy love Congo. Amy throw poo. I'll throw poo right back at you if you don't keep quiet. Where was I? Oh yeah, yeah, why Congo stinks. Our story begins way back in 1979, after Michael Crichton made the great train robbery with Sean Connery. He wanted to do his spin on King Solomon's Minds with Connery in the lead and pitched the idea to a producer, Frank Yablens. Connery would play a great white hunter in Africa, not unlike Alan Quartermain, a part he would later play in the also bad The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yablens pitched the idea to 20th Century Fox, who bought the rights well before the book was ever written, which would come to be called Congo. There were a couple of problems, though. One, you couldn't actually train a gorilla to do what Crichton wanted his gorilla to do, and two, special effects technology had not reached the point where you could believably create fake gorillas. Despite those problems, the movie was pitched to some big-time directors like John Carpenter and Steven Spielberg. Amy love E.T. Yeah, you would. But those directors also passed on it, so the film was shelved. There was an attempt to unshelve it in the 80s, but that too floundered. It wasn't until Jurassic Park was a massive hit that studios were itching to get back in the Crichton business again. Also, Michael Crichton was blown away by the work Stan Winston did in bringing dinosaurs to life, and thought that special effects had caught up with Congo. Yablens, who still liked the idea of Congo, had pitched Kathleen Kennedy on it. Kennedy, in addition to being the creative force for all the Star Wars stuff these days, was also one of the producers of Jurassic Park. She also knew just the guy to direct Congo, a guy named Frank Marshall, who she was coincidentally married to. So Kathleen Kennedy would produce along with Yablins and Frank Marshall would direct. Marshall directed the hit Arachnophobia in 1990 and then scored again with Alive in 1993. That movie was written by Joe vs. the Volcano scribe and all-around talented writer John Patrick Shanley. So when Marshall came on board, he ditched much of Crichton's script and John Patrick Shanley gave the whole business a glossy coat of paint. Marshall sent Shanley the book and asked him what he thought of it. Shanley said, rather judiciously, quote, I like the title. Then, quote, I like that it starts in San Francisco and they go to the Congo. I like that. Rather than Marshall deciding to get a writer who, you know, liked the story more than the locations and the title, he said, great. Shanley was actually surprised to be picked to write the film, and he did so out of a sense of loyalty to Frank Marshall, and a desire to turn some of the tropes on their head. For instance, it was John Patrick Shanley's idea to have the great white hunter be not white. After some resistance, Marshall and Kennedy agreed, and Shanley went to work writing this whatever it is. Ernie Hudson would ultimately be cast in the role that was originally envisioned for Sean Connery, and Hudson says it's still one of his favorite roles, one he said he would love to revisit way back in 2021 when he was asked what parts he'd like to return to. The rest of the cast would be filled out by Dylan Walsh in a role turned down by Hugh Grant, and Laura Linney in a role turned down by Robin Wright. 
Oh, uh, also Joe Don Baker in a role turned down by Fred Thompson. Bruce Campbell was going to play the primate researcher lead that eventually went to Dylan Walsh, but he was bounced down to the guy who dies eating a Hershey bar. Basically, everyone is a second or third choice in this stinker, except for Stan Winston. It was up to the Jurassic Park guy to come up with Amy, the signing gorilla, and the mysterious gray apes. Amy happy. Amy good gorilla. I swear to... Originally, there was some talk about making the apes all CGI, but it turned out that tests showed animal fur still looked pretty fake, so they went with animatronics and costumes. Rick Baker, who did the Kong suit in the 1976 King Kong... Pick six movies, season eight, episode one. You know what? That one I'm going to give to you, Amy. Yeah, him. He also did the ape costumes for the Christopher Lambert Tarzan movie and Gorillas in the Mist about Diane Fossey. Rick Baker was the kind of guy you called if you wanted to have an ape outfit in your movies. And Stan Winston wanted to prove that his studio could do anything Rick Baker could do and do it better. The trouble was, what director Frank Marshall wanted kept changing. Winston gave his artists a rudimentary idea of what the ape should look like and told them to make some creatures with real character. You can't really tell in the movie, but these were careful designs with intricate work, a dozen or so really good ape costumes, and actors who trained for months inside them to capture the performances and give life to the scary monkeys. Winston would later say that the sets and the lighting did nothing to help his designs. A big, bland pile of red rocks doesn't do much for the look of these things. But, despite a script that veers wildly from one tone to another, hammy acting, and some less than convincing ape suits, Congo was a hit. On a budget of $50 million, it made three times that. There was a bad video game tie-in, a pretty good pinball machine, and all kinds of collector cups and commercial promotions to get it over the finish line. But critically, the movie was a disaster. The Washington Post called it, quote, the least interesting adventure film ever filmed, while Variety said it, quote, feels as if the picture were edited to leave the action sequences in while removing any connecting material that might have helped them make sense out. Amy love Congo. Amy wait for Bo to sleep. Amy strike then. What? Nothing. Keep it down. Is this movie really so bad? And can we somehow make fun of Tim Curry's accent when it appears to be making fun of itself? To answer that, let's get Chad in here and Amy out of here and get to some serious monkey business. Ladies and gentlemen, primates and playmates, it's 1995's Congo. Come here, you stupid intern ape. Welcome to yet another episode <laughs> of Pick Six Movies, but not just any episode. No! This is a season premiere, and <laughs> nothing says season premiere about one of the most boring movies we've ever done on this show. <laughs> I, of course, am one of your hosts, uh, Bo Ranstell, and with me as ever is my own personal talking gorilla, mm -hmm. Chad Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I am partially responsible for Amy the Gorilla getting that one-day internship. Diane in HR, she called me and asked my thoughts and i knew that you were batting lead off on this season so i was like sure i don't give a shit yeah and and then i told her i was like i'm pretty sure that that guy randolph the intern we had in like season seven or eight mm -hmm. he was either a ghost or a vampire and i just was like look bringing a gorilla in for a day we're not coloring too far out of the lines than what we've already done in the past and let's just be honest the biggest problem we have <laughs> is that amy's got an attitude <laughs> For being a talking gorilla that requires this backpack to make herself heard in the first place, little mouthy. <laughs> it's been a few years. Yeah. You know, she's been hanging in the jungle doing whatever the hell she's been doing. So yeah, She's been under some bridges. She looks rough. That fur is patchy at best. <laughs> somebody put a nickel in her. Looks like somebody's been putting cigarettes out on her. <laughs> Sticking their hands in great jelly jars and drying them off on her back. Right, she's like one of the ladies in the background of a Tarantino movie that's been on the junk for a while. It's like something that would try to eat a fraggle. <laughs> <You're> right? Yeah. <laughs> Amy loved Muppet. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> In what way?
Hey. I gotta ask you, in yes. your introduction, who was the asshole that said, we need to tell Coco that Robin Williams is dead? No, you don't! Yeah, we really do. She's gonna read it in the papers. You know, she's gonna <laughs> find out. Right. I would rather have her hear it from me. You know, it was some sadist that was like, dude, I'm totally going in there. I wasn't here when, when she found out that her kitten died. I definitely want to be there when she finds out that the guy who did Aladdin's voice is dead. When her kitten ran into the street and was squashed like a bug. <laughs> I didn't have the opportunity to drop that bomb on her. And there's nothing I like more than gorilla tears. I was so worried that you were going to say that she sat on her kitten and killed it. Also, a lot of what was in your introduction, I was like, this really feels like they're inferring. <laughs> you know, like, like the combination of words and stuff. Yeah. Like, mm, really? Okay. Yeah. But All that's right. that's the thing that's fascinating about it. And, and something that I've long been interested in is the idea that human beings are constantly trying to make patterns out of things it's just part of our, our consciousness and it does beg the question like is she really talking is it a, because you also have to allow for the fact that she's a gorilla and maybe gorillas just think differently than people and so the means of communication is mm -hmm. going to come across in this kind of staccato repetitive way or it's just her wanting to get treats like my dog <laughs> <laughs> like my dog knows what time that it's time for a walk or when he gets his, his streets or it, it's about time to go outside and does some elaborate stuff to make sure that I'm aware of it. I don't know. I don't know. It's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. Nobody does yet. Not until we've got a robo gorilla. I just got a slack message from our fact checker, which I was against this idea at the beginning. Like I don't need people slack. Yeah, I was too. <sighs> I've already made one mistake. Robin Williams did not do the voice of Aladdin. He was the voice of the genie in Aladdin. So thanks a lot, Todd. You know, tell Todd to shut up. That's like somebody correcting you when they're like, oh, no, Boris Karloff was Frankenstein's monster, not Frankenstein. It's like, yeah, we all know, Todd. We know what we're talking about. <laughs> Ugh. We, our intern program is it's hit rock bottom chad we gotta talk a gorilla and todd the annoying fact checker yeah on slack yeah <laughs> I, I i'm not happy about any of this these are bad hires and i know we're not paying them anything <laughs> i remember when they used to just get high and then at the end i was like how was it they're like oh i forgot to hit record <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, did they record the show twice <laughs> who would have believed those were the good old days oh my god uh, covid changes everything doesn't it the big problem is just public education chad it's just <laughs> it's turning out yahoos and dumb dumbs <laughs> to an alarming degree <laughs> But I felt that this movie was so incompetently made. It looks cheap. Yeah. And I can't tell if it's looking cheap on purpose to be a throwback to the movie serials you mentioned in your introduction, or just if the filmmakers didn't care. And I think it's the latter than the former. It's tough to say because that is a, a thing that when you're watching this movie, you can't help but pause periodically and be like, this looks like the Jungle Cruise. I mean, some scenes lifted directly from the Jungle Cruise, but also this just look it's that level of production it's yeah it's okay it's recognizable as jungle sets but it still looks like a jungle set the movie needs a wacky tour guide like the weird owl song skipper dan that's what we need in this movie is a skipper dad to cut up a little bit and we'll get into this in more detail here in a minute but i think that the movie also doesn't have a protagonist or really an antagonist mm -hmm. every character in this movie feels like a secondary supporting actor with no real anchor to move the film along yeah that was one of the big complaints when it came out a lot of reviews said that was that the secondary characters way overshadow the primary characters and there's no clear antagonist is it the monkeys kind of but is it tim curry not really but sort of or the, the volcano or just given the fact that this was written by john patrick shanley <laughs> the fact that no one says take me to the volcano is really upsetting <laughs> why would you not do that for yourself you know this movie opens up and we're on the savannas of africa and this film wastes no time in giving us the movie's title congo mm -hmm. and then Bo. we don't get any other credits finally a movie that gets it title that of the movie you, start yeah. the movie that's right <laughs> if anything this movie figures it out i don't give a shit who <laughs> 
<laughs> edited this and based on and by and all these. Just here's the title of the movie and then just get going. I think it's more a matter of like, do not put my name up front on this thing. <laughs> Would you like your name in the opening credits? Uh, no, thank you. And you? No, thank you. You? No, no, no. Just continue. As soon as people see them climb into that balloon, spoilers, <laughs> this is with a bunch of people climbing into a balloon. As soon as people see that, they were out the door. Nobody knew who directed this, wrote it, starred in it. If you did not know just by virtue of osmosis who these people were, you would have no idea that a professional crew made this movie. No. So we're on the savannas of Africa, and there's there's this team of white guys, and they're all outside, and they're wearing khaki pants and these red Patagonia jackets, and they're marching up the side of a hill with a bunch of locals that they paid to carry their gear. Good luck, guys. And they reach Mount Mukinko, mm-hmm. as the title overlay tells us, which is a extinct volcano mm-hmm. that's near Rwanda. Yeah, and Bruce Campbell is in the lead of this expedition. What? He's the head scientist. Yeah. This movie came out on the heels of Bruce Campbell in his failed Western comedy something, The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. Sure. And that was on the heels of the triumph from return of him as Ash and Army of Darkness. But in this movie, it appears that he's trying to be an actor mm. and really tamps down all of the boorish, arrogant Bruce Campbellness we know and love. It's hard for this part to include him hitting in himself in the head with a plate but that's really what bruce campbell is made for (laughs) i love bruce campbell to no end but he needs to be grabbing himself by the back of the head and flipping himself over that is the genius of bruce campbell (laughs) the movie then cuts to outer space where we see a travicom satellite drifting through the cosmos in that scene And then we come back to Earth, where we meet Laura Lenny, who is a doctor of something. She's also an ex-CIA operative, and she's a Rhodes Scholar. She's a bikini supermodel, astrophysicist, Formula 500 driver, and a heck of a cook, if I don't mind saying so. And I have to think that when you watch this, you're like, well, Bo must enjoy this part of it, at least. You know what I thought? I was like, what is it? about Laura Linney that Bo is so drawn. I still can't figure it out. She (laughs) frightens me. Maybe that's what I like is that she's a little scary, you know? (laughs) But not in that Xena on a top way where she's going to kill you by squeezing you with her thighs or nothing. Like, she's the kind of person that slowly poisons you over years. And I appreciate that. There's something about that New England bit Atlantic. I think it's because I think she's too good for me. (laughs) I'm naturally attracted to women out of my league. When I think of her (laughs) in all of the roles that she's done, I always go back to the Truman Show. And in that, she just gets so manic. And the moment where she's doing the ad for the coffee and Jim Carrey's just like, who the hell are you talking to? Like... (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> i adore her in that i think she's great and even love actually i think of her in that mm-hmm. um i haven't watched ozark because i got shit to do i think she's a wonderful actress i would love to see her and julianne Moore in a panic off where they just play <laughs> characters that are at the brink because they both excel at it and i want to see who's the best <laughs> I could see that. You could throw Claire Danes in there, have her as a back. If you just want to do the scene in the pharmacy from Magnolia with each of them giving it a shot, Mm -hmm. I I would be fine with that. Who are you to ask me? It would be wonderful. Maybe you call up those idiots at the Masked Singer and you do the Masked Manic and you just put (laughs) actors and actresses inside flamboyant owl and alligator costumes and have them perform. (laughs) And just scenes from Magnolia. There's enough of them that you could just go through the whole movie like the whole season or you pick one movie and that's your season like everybody's gonna give a magnolia a shot this season squid and the whale and the, the world according to garp sure speak of laura lenny like you can count on me what was the one where them kids get burned up manchester by the sea you give that one a go good god so we're in this like science lab something laura lenny enters and we hear someone say we have a satellite from the Congo and then this movie hacker character walks over to this top secret door and opens it up with a voice activated passcode my name is Warner Brandis my voice is my passport verify me I have to stop you right there because the voice code is him going Rudy 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 yeah. which yeah. is a Cary Grant joke yeah well I thought it was Judy 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 I think it was just a typo and nobody gave a shit but also who is that for who did they think was coming to this movie and be like oh my god they 
did it. <laughs> they, they hit the Cary Grant demographic as well as the crazed monkey demographic. They don't care whose toes they step on. <laughs> right. Primates or first mates. <laughs> so they make their way into this top secret room where the Pasco gets changed every few hours because Joe Don Baker, the boss of this operation, who also turns out is Bruce Campbell's dad mm-hmm. in the movie. And also Bruce Campbell is Laura Linney's ex fiance mm-hmm. but none of this matters well we're gonna be saying that a lot because there's a lot of stuff in this movie that doesn't matter and it's one of the things that just blows your mind in the course of this film that why is she the ex and not the fiance because then there would be stakes because it's not like she ever has a relationship <laughs> with dr peter who we'll get to in a minute why not what is the harm in giving this movie some if not romance but it gives her more of a reason to get all up in Joe Don Baker's face about his feelings toward his son. Because if it's an ex fiance, that means she's got a grudge. And you know, Laura Lenny carries a grudge like none other. Oh, are you kidding me? The raise of an eyebrow, and you're like, oh my God, the temperature just dropped 12 degrees. She is secretly orchestrating his journey to Africa to get him out of the country because she doesn't want to ever <laughs> see that son of a bitch again. They fire up this Pee Wee Herman picture cam, and Laura Lenny is chatting it up with her ex-fiance bruce campbell who appears to be on the set of gilligan's island like i've never been to the congo so i can't say if this fake ass set is an accurate representation of the congo but it's not though i like when almost immediately there's a tremor because the volcano may or may not go off at some point it will but he kind of does this star trek kind of shimmy where they just yeah. shake the camera he's like oh we get a lot of that around here well 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 if it isn't laura linney my ex-fiance come crawling back to get brucey on your good size look sugar plums i'm on this volcano island thing having a bunch of intermittent earthquakes as represented by the camera guy shaking left and right every so often by the way i found those blue diamond things i was sent down here to find and look when you put the diamonds into this handheld silver cannon it blasts out a death laser ray check this out Boom! ain't that a peach well, you know what? let's sync up in an hour later tater click <laughs> well he says he wants to share all this glory with his buddy jeffrey i just couldn't possibly take all the credit for this not something that bruce campbell would ever say bruce campbell would be like this was all me i found it all. yeah <laughs> any of these prehistoric shitheads had nothing to do with it make sure you spell the name right c-a-m-p-b-e-l-l two l's and if you're looking for me i'll be the one they're making a statue of <laughs> He says he's going to go off and find the source of this stream where his buddy Jeffrey is, where they found all these diamonds. Laura Lenny screams out, I need your coordinates! I need your coordinates! And he's gone. Right. So he goes off in search of this friend of his and is just like, where did these screw heads go? And finds <laughs> his buddy. I found this totally awesome swimming hole. It's filled with Legionnaire's disease. Come on, let's take a dip. All right, well, if you're expecting me to get naked and show you my giblies, you got another good thing coming. But they go through this hot spring which we never see again Uh uh-uh to this hidden temple question mark i don't know jeffrey goes down some hole and then i guess he gets killed or who knows well we kind of find out in a moment that his time on earth is short-lived we cut back to houston where laura lenny meets up with joe don baker which how is joe don baker in movies he is terrible he's worse than jennifer tilly terrible we last saw him in that dukes of hazard movie remember he was like the governor of georgia or something (laughs) he was awful in that dude he shows up with a golf putter and a t-shirt that just says rich asshole on it he's wearing a sport coat and they drive him up in a golf cart so you know he didn't come from the back nine apparently this telecommunications company has a golf course adjacent or something he says to laura lenny with the right laser and those diamonds like that we could dominate the communication <clears throat> communicate what's it say Communi- we could dominate communicate In- the- hold on i get this i can get this we can dominate the communications industry overnight and you're just like well this all sounds pretty legit lasers diamonds communication industry but all adds up if you ask me yeah i guess i mean it's as close to a explanation of anything we get in this movie but so then we cut back to bruce campbell jeffrey jeffrey where are you i'm out here eating this hershey bar all by myself that's gonna go right to my hips i need you to eat at least half of this thing 
<laughs> Besides, we're supposed to transmit in 10 minutes. And then something hits Bruce Campbell in the back. He turns around, picks it up, and it's an eyeball. Uh-huh. And then Bruce Campbell screams as something approaches in that scene. And it's a good Bruce Campbell scream. It's a, a real, ah! <laughs> which I've seen Bruce Campbell scream in a number of films, and I enjoy it every time. Yeah. We cut back to Travacom HQ and Joe Don Baker and Lauren Lenny. They sync up their cameras, and then they pan around the campsite in Africa, and they see the whole crew is dead. And there are these mysterious creatures running around knocking over all the equipment, and then the signal disappears. What's going on here, Bo? This is getting crazy. I just want to point out here, this set looks asylum-level cheap. It's basically like four chairs, some old, to use this reference again, Star Trek leftover sets. It looks like a high school play. Like, all the plants (laughs) are fake plastic. It looks terrible. It looks incredibly cheap. And then Laura Linney is like, turn on the infrared. We need to confirm whether or not these people are alive. And sure enough, you see seven bodies is what they discover. And then you get some more glimpses of monkeys running around these big gray monkeys and then one of them hits the camera and the whole signal goes dead. Mm-hmm. And Laura Lenny is like, I didn't see Charles. Charles wasn't there. That means I can still really twist the knife. Is Charles Bruce Campbell? Yeah. Okay, I don't remember his name. Yeah, her whole point is like, he's not dead until I say he's dead. Joe Don Baker jumps in on this and he's like, nobody knows this happened. All right, uh, I need to get those diamonds, Laura Lenny. It's the future. This satellite is our cash cow, but I need a new cash a new cash cow. And these, and these diamonds are it, Laura Lenny. Cut. All right, I that's it. It's lunch, everybody. Uh, Joe Don Baker. Joe, Joe, please don't say cut. That's my job. Well, you know what? Agree to disagree. I was in Walking Tall, <laughs> so All right. I think I outranked. What was your name again? Marshall? His Corporal Walking Tall is his rank. <laughs> so he tells Laura Liddy, you need to go to the field. You're a good field agent, and also, I don't give a shit about my son. Wait, did I say that? I mean, I really care about my son. He went to the Congo to please you. You're his father. Tell me that you love your son. And then, getting involved in geopolitics which this movie kind of does in a way that is totally confusing uh-huh. Jodon Baker is like look Zaire's gonna shut down the border as soon as they hear about these diamonds. So we get you in there quick. We need to find an expedition that's already going to the Congo. Hey, that's the name of this movie. That's pretty good. Hey, d- add that sound. I said Congo. Yeah, <laughs> like the movie. All right, cut. <laughs> so then the movie cuts over to Berkeley, California, where we meet future Pick 6 movies intern Amy the Gorilla, <laughs> who is painting pictures of green leaves of the jungle, and they're all in these different pieces of paper. Some of them have what appears to be a yellow eye in the middle of them and we see that Amy has made the cover of Life magazine that was a big deal once upon a time Mm -hmm. she's also playing a little doom which seems advanced for this talking gorilla but whatever (laughs) there's this lab assistant in this primate research lab his name's Richard and he's helping Amy finger paint and Amy's main keeper trainer secret lover Mm -hmm. Dr. Peter Elliott comes in and Amy just jumps up and embraces him and they both kiss and hug and hold each other a little too long Long and at the same time, not long enough. <laughs> I got the uncomfortable part, the not long enough might just be you. <laughs> I like what I like. And this is somebody that finds the relationship between Jessica Ling and King Kong to be highly erotically charged. <laughs> we cut to an auditorium where Dr. Peter is presenting in front of a crowd where he shows that he has taught Amy the Gorilla sign language, but then they also introduce this device that looks like a souped up Nintendo Power Glove that can take <laughs> sign language and translate it to speech. So now you can hear Amy the gorilla talk sort of but not really you're just interpreting her sign language the most effective moment of this movie is in this scene but doesn't have anything to do with the gorilla or Dr. Peter it's when they show the video where they're like oh yeah we invented this prosthesis thing and here's this guy who's never spoken before and he signs something and you hear the voice come out and then he signs that's the first time I've ever heard my voice but it's you know that is the first time i ever heard my voice and you're like wow that's really effective that's like seeing those youtube videos of babies that get the cochlear implants and hear Mm -hmm. for the first time the rush limbaugh special (laughs) i think of that as just pills but whatever and that is the moment when i was watching the movie i was like oh i kind of just want to watch videos about this guy and now that he can speak and like going out into the world and living his life with this newfound ability and how it changes it but then we get back to this stupid gorilla and i'm like oh this is a and also worth pointing out 
Amy the Gorilla is one of those things that falls into the uncanny valley of it's definitely somebody in a suit, but it looks pretty gorilla-like, but not close enough to actually look like a gorilla. Yeah, it looks, your brain is like, that's fake. That's not real. I don't want to be that guy, but I'm going to be that guy Mm -hmm. who says this compared to the book. I read this book decades ago. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not a great book, Mm -hmm. but it has an interesting concept where if you have taught a gorilla sign language, could that gorilla serve as an interpreter to other primates to be able to communicate what other gorillas are thinking to humans in addition to what they're thinking Mm -hmm. and they don't touch on any of that in this movie which is fine i get that things have to be cut out for the adaptation of a book to a movie but that's the most interesting nugget of the book as i remember it there is one line where they vaguely reference that but yes you're right Here's my complaint with this movie. Go on. (laughs) Just one? All right. Amy's ability to sign and having this Nintendo Power Glove that turns it into speech doesn't matter. It serves no purpose in this movie whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Amy's ability to communicate with humans could be extracted 100% from this movie. And it could just be like, oh, Amy's painting pictures of the jungle. We need to take Amy home. And then that's what they're doing. It adds nothing that she can sign and that there is the ability for people to hear words that represent her thoughts there's a certain point in the movie at the end of this film where she just disappears from the film and other than taking her back to the jungle because she's having bad dreams that is the (laughs) (laughs) which is which if you stop that is the plot of this movie yes is, is that this gorilla keeps having bad dreams and isn't having good sleepy time so dr peter organizes is this multi-million dollar expedition to the Congo right. uh-huh. so that she can get a better night's sleep instead of try and say cocoa or melatonin or any of these <laughs> <laughs> these possible solutions or just trinket it like that's what Amy's after at the end of the day we'll get to it but if, if she knew the sign for it she would be like Amy need knockout pills she just puts her hand and like her thumb depresses the plunger of a needle <laughs> into the crook of her arm repeatedly yeah. I get it I get it Amy love gank. Amy love gank. <laughs> so this audience watching this presentation where Amy comes up and we hear her voice for the first time, they're just dumbstruck. They're like, that gorilla is really talking. Like, you idiots. So out in the audience is, is Tim Curry. And he is listening intently as he pulls out a ring that has an eye on it that looks very much like Amy the gorilla's finger paintings that we saw earlier and if you forgot what those finger paintings look like the movie fades from the ring into the painting into one of those monsters that we saw that killed bruce campbell and then this ends with amy the gorilla waking up with her frightful nightmares about let me ask you a question why (laughs) does tim curry have this ring in a hollowed out book (laughs) <laughs> because that's what he pulls it out of did he just come from a haunted library is he in the midst of a mystery or perhaps a scavenger hunt this is all pre 9 11 so getting that through airports and customs sneaking it in the book he's like nobody is going to look inside the book i can't wait to do this accent by the way i'm already <laughs> excited about it but even if he had thought to himself i need the book to get ring fast god said <laughs> airport even if that were true why then take the book to the lecture you've never carved out the inside of a bible to hide a gun or your drugs that takes time man you do that you're not just gonna leave it at home you carry it around with you so if somebody was like hey what's that you've got there oh this this is not ring from secret city of zinge this is book well can i what what are you reading can i open up no you cannot open book promise me you will not read past page 30 or you can pick up book around page 328 but open from the back if you thumb through (laughs) it is not as good the middle of book not good first page excellent last page 
Mwah. Everything <laughs> in between is how you say poop. So we cut to Dr. <laughs> Peter and Richard, the lab assistant, and they go in and they calm down Amy the gorilla, which Bo, I fully expected Amy the gorilla to rip off one of these guys' arms and just start beating the other one to death with this severed limb. Yeah, jaw and then genitals. That's how it goes. <laughs> the you all of the hands at the wrist. Yeah. Dr. Peter comes out and he says, other gorillas in captivity, they go bananas and they have to be destroyed. Wait a minute. All these paintings make this room look like the jungle. She wants to go home. So this Dr. Peter goes to the head of the university and he says, you know how we abducted Amy the gorilla from the jungle a few years ago? I want to take her back to the jungle and maybe she could teach other gorillas sign language. What? What? Huh? Why? And this is, by the way, the president of the university or the guy holding the purse strings, played by Clue Gulliger. Uh-huh. Famous from like Return of the Living Dead and Poltergeist. And the whole time of like, you know, uh, we're going to take Amy to Mesa Verde. It's a whole new <laughs> part of the construction. Uh, you moved the headstones, but you didn't move the gorillas. But yeah, so like you said, he wants to teach other gorillas to talk just by Amy showing up and being like, you stupid, Amy smart. Amy teach you to talk. I guess, but what's in it for Amy? Why would she not just immediately ditch this backpack and be done with it? Yeah. And then poof, Tim Curry shows up in a cloud of smoke. <laughs> And he's got this Romanian accent. And he says, I will pay for him to go. Let me introduce myself. My name's Tim Curry, pronounced with an urry. You ladies know that I like them furry. Wink, wink. <laughs> I am a mysterious bad guy in movie pretending to be good guy. To prove it, I go around the world doing good. Would bad guy travel world doing good? Of course not. I am good guy, but secretly I'm bad guy. Maybe. We'll find out. His accent in this movie, we are not taking it for a walk the way that you might think if you've never seen this movie his accent is outrageous in this film it's almost a reason to watch it he's got this goatee and this perpetually furrowed brow he looks like a slavic version of the grinch who stole christmas did you ever see the clip of him doing a cutscene from one of the command and conquer games uh -uh. and he's using kind of this accent and i'll i'll drop it into the show so listeners you will hear this but it's him <laughs> saying i'm going to take us where they won't expect us to go space it is <laughs> delightful insert audio clip here i'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism space he is doing that crazy accent in this movie completely what do you think of when you hear the name tim curry what immediately comes to mind kind of two things legend and rocky horror are probably the two that i immediately think of and then maybe yeah. clue is a distant third i go clue yeah i'm not a fan of that kind of farce yeah but clue is so ridiculously over the top that it's worth a look see maybe i don't know it's been years since i've seen it i like clue i think he's incredible as darkness and i don't think legend is a great movie but i think he's amazing in it and rocky horror is one of those things like talk about an actor just taken apart for a walk uh -huh. he is incredible in that movie he is so much fun and the movie mm -hmm. itself you can argue that it's not very good i don't think it's a great movie but i think it's oh fun. you don't have to argue that it's not very good <laughs> but tim curry is really good at it and and that's the thing about tim curry is that he kind of elevates most of the stuff that he's in but nobody jerked the chain on this accent which needed to happen somebody needed to be like you need to take it back about four notches have a light romanian <laughs> accent but you sound like you are dracula's dialogue coach <laughs> you're at boris and natasha i need you to come back about 38 percent yeah and then you're gonna be oh you're close you are right next door to a borat <laughs> <laughs> dr peter looks up at tim curry and he says really you'll pay for it all right let me go pack up my bags and grab my fake talking gorilla and my lab assistant richard and we'll all go to the jungle and then we see amy the gorilla she's so excited when she sees He's Dr. Peter. She's like, tickle me, tickle me. And I don't quite know their relationship and I don't think I want to. That's fair. I think you do know their relationship. They're uh, having I, I, sex. Yeah, I think you just don't want to admit it. I, like, why <laughs> else would you teach this gorilla to talk and also program certain words that 
it can't say. Like, Amy is signing, but no words are coming out. Like, well, there are some things that are just for us. That, that clearly looks like she's signing stop. <laughs> like, I don't know sign language, but that looks like stop. And it's not saying anything. I don't know what that means. Dr. Peter and Richard, the assistant, Amy, the gorilla. They then get on a plane. And then just for some reason, Laura Lenny shows up and gets on the same plane, which I was like, how did she hook up with Dr. Peter and his crew? How did she know that they were going to the exact same place in the Congo where Bruce Campbell was last seen? And she says, hey, did you get all my phone calls and letters and FedExes? Because you know Laura Lenny is the kind of person to have a plan B, C, and D. This whole time, Amy the gorilla is signing with her voice-activated power glove. And she's saying, ugly, ugly woman, ugly, skanky woman. She is dirty. Lady is a tramp. <laughs> that smell is her crotch. Gross. Filthy whore. Filthy, filthy, filthy whore. Dr. Peter, beware. Dr. Peter is just like, she does this with all the women. I think she's a little bit jealous. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Say, are you single? Or perhaps have a fiancé that might be dead or is no longer a fiancé or some combination of those? It's strange. They don't really try to imply any sort of romantic connection between these two. There's one moment during the scene where Ernie Hudson listens to all those monkeys fucking in the jungle. Mm -hmm. But that's about it. A hundred percent. That is the only time in this movie where anything approaching a romantic spark is between these two uh -huh. but again it's just a, another problem with this movie of like i don't care about anything that's happening because the characters don't seem to care it turns out they need $56,000 in bribe money, and Laura Linney is there to grease the skids. Cut to Jimmy Buffett piloting this plane down the runway for takeoff. Uh -huh. This movie has so many B and C list celebrity cameos. It's like a Muppet movie. <laughs> uh, Tower, this is uh, Flight to Margaritaville. We're going to be incommunicado <laughs> for a little bit. Uh, we're going to try to fly around those stars falling on Alabama. And... Your in flight crew will be coming around with cheeseburgers in paradise for you and yeah. some land shark beer land shark land shark beer the official beer of jimmy buffett airlines if you look out the window you'll see uh fins to the left uh the other side you'll see fins <laughs> to the right <laughs> What is he doing in this movie? Uh, All right. So. Yeah, like, for, well, he did the song from Arachnophobia. Which also, I just want to raise a point. You said that Arachnophobia was like a successful movie. I remember seeing Arachnophobia and thinking, this is garbage. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it was successful. <laughs> like it made money? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go back and listen to that Lone Ranger intro, and you can wrestle that philosophical point. Which, by the way, uh -huh. you really hammered the Lone Ranger for being a boring movie. This is one of the most boring things we've ever had to watch i agree <laughs> i'm not saying that this is not a duller than dirt movie it's an hour 40 that's the only thing it's it's almost an hour shorter than the lone ranger and so lone ranger is really boring and it's super long this is really boring and nothing happens in this movie bo nothing well like all right, I mean, we're, you're right, we're gonna you're right. get to all the nothing that doesn't happen right but on the plane though there's this great moment where tim curry is like we are taking ab home and Amy, the gorilla, meanwhile, just starts hurling pickled eggs at Laura Lenny. <laughs> She's like, hey. And Amy's like, you ugly. You suck eggs. She keeps calling her ugly. Yeah. Ugly woman. Well, and then <laughs> Dr. Peter says, I'll explain this later. But his explanation is just like, yeah, she just thinks you're ugly. <laughs> like, why kick that can? Why not do if you want to get me to watch one of those Real Housewives shows, you put a talking gorilla that throws pickled eggs and just talks smack to everyone and gets drunk, I'd watch that. Because that's kind of what's going on here. There's a, a, the first mention, Tim Curry is like, by the way, the Aquila apes. And Dr. Peter is like, no, 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 that's a myth. Gorillas are very gentle. There's no such thing. And then Amy starts freaking out because the plane has taken off. Amy, drink. Amy, need drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amy needs something to calm her nerves. And so she signs for a green drop drink is what she calls it. Yeah, this gorilla needs to go to a meeting. <laughs> She needs a John Mulaney style intervention. Actually, Dr. Peter gets up and makes her a martini in a martini glass with a skewer that has two olives on it. Uh -huh. And this gorilla just kicks back like a good eight to 10 ounces of gin or vodka. Amy no like. Green drop drink not dry enough. Go back and make new one. We cut to nighttime and Amy the gorilla is passed out in the seat, Bo. I think she had uh, T 
see many martinis. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and while she's passed out, this is the point where Peter's like, hey, I'm sorry she called you ugly, but, you know, she thinks you're ugly. Sorry about that. And Laura Lenny is like, I have a fundamental question. Why are you doing any of this? <laughs> Why are you teaching her to talk? Why are you taking her back to the Congo? And he's like, well, it's because human beings just have an inherent nature and an inherent curiosity. Mm. It's the the lonely impulse of delight, he says. Which, by the way, she recognizes this as a quote from Yeats, but the poem is all about a dude who's about to die and is oh. weighing the idea of my life didn't mean anything anyway, so my death doesn't mean anything either. I'm so glad it wasn't a poem about a guy having sex with a monkey. That's Shel Silverstein, not Yates. Yeah. <laughs> I like that Laura Lenny calls him out. She's like, do you think it was a good idea to give that gorilla bottle service? I mean, she polished off that bottle of beef eaters before we hit international waters, man. And also, why did you program slurring into her voice box? <laughs> it's how we knew, you know. Amy's <laughs> sick of your shit. Amy drunk gorilla. <laughs> Amy angry. <laughs> Amy want a cheeseburger in paradise. <laughs> So our plate lands in Central Africa, as the text overlay informs us. That's a big place, Bo. Central Africa. Uh Uh-huh. The middle of the biggest continent, sure. Our movie's characters deplane to be greeted by none other than Joe Pantoliano, Joey Pants, in an uncredited role in this movie. What the hell is he doing in this film? It's a great question. Hey, I heard you need a little something for your expedition. Well, I got it all. Joey Pants here at this airport. I got everything you need. You need walkie-talkies. You need people to carry a litter with you on it you need some guns you need some money you need some bribes whatever you want joey's gonna get it for you get on this golf cart hey you want to sell that gorilla it's worth 25 grand for a female gorilla and then amy the gorilla sobers up enough to say amy want to go home amy needs another drink amy i drunk amy think you drunk and joey pants goes whoa a talking gorilla i can feel the money hairs on my neck going woo 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 that's actual dialogue from this movie and that's why you hire joey pants to be in your film i had the same line written down because it's one of those that like anyone else saying this line <laughs> short of christopher walken it's joey pants or christopher walken or bill burr oh you sure sure <laughs> but those are the only those three are the only people that can get away with saying the money hairs on the back of my neck go woo 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 <laughs> about this time a group of militants run by with guns and off in the background a car explodes at this airport which does not phase joey pants one bit laura lenny dr peter richard the lab assistant tim curry and the mostly still drunk amy the gorilla all simultaneously shit themselves in the back of this golf cart and joey pants says hey we're on the third government in two years everybody's a little tense let me see your passports ka-chunk 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 there wasn't that easier than going through customs oh and by the way that guy that you hired i fired him and i got somebody else and they're like what is happening here (laughs) did we hire you or were you just an opportunist <laughs> waiting for us to get off the plane enter into the movie at this point the guy that he hired for them who is a, a character named monroe but it's ernie hudson uh-huh who shows up to just be the closest thing to a stable actor in this movie he's got this distractingly muddled accent yeah. like sometimes it's there then someone reminds him that he's supposed to have an accent when he's not doing it and he <laughs> whips it back up <laughs> And it's kind of African, it's kind of British... It's, it's all terrible. It's a mess, yeah. And you really feel like he should be the hero of the movie. But he doesn't do anything heroic in this film. He doesn't do anything in this movie. Nobody does anything in this movie. But yeah, the only thing Ernie Hudson does in this movie is he'll kind of be wise about things and comment on the action of the movie such as it is. He smokes. He hides. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't do anything. He, he doesn't shoot any monkeys with lasers or anything. Like No. None of that happens. He offers no helpful advice in the jungle he's yeah so he hops off this jeep and he says well i hope you all have a lot of money it appears as though someone has blown up the president's car (laughs) pardon me while i pull a gun and commandeer a passing military truck the way rogue heroes do which is what he does it's like gta he just holds up the jeep (laughs) shoves the guy out and they've got a car now and they all pile into it but also he gets in the back and i'm like so who's driving again i know it was the driver who drove him up i had to go back and rewind it (laughs) because i was like did they all just get in the back of the truck and they're like so we're 
we're not moving. Oh, very sorry. I assumed that the man that I shoved out of the jeep would come <laughs> back. He would politely return and, and take us to our final destination. They take off. The jeep gets stopped at the gate. Richard, the assistant, starts to mouth off. He's like, I got to get out of here. But Ernie Hudson grabs him and covers his mouth. And is like, I'm afraid you're going to have to shut up, my good man. And then they get away. And then that's it. With no resistance. They just pull up and they're like, uh, where are you headed to? Over there. All right. Let him through. Ernie Hudson lights up a cigar and Amy is like, Amy hung over. Amy could uh, use a smoke. Amy want one of those Chesterfields you got there. Amy likes to read history. Amy saw a pack. <laughs> filtered. Amy think you were a pussy. Amy the gorilla, she drinks. She smokes. We got a real Lorraine McFly on our hands here, Bo, if I ever saw one. I was going to say Humphrey Bogart, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to get the two confused. Oh, it is it ever. I'm attracted <laughs> to both of them. Ernie Hudson says, I'm your great white hunter for this trip. <laughs> but I happen to be black, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> yeah, we get it. We're headed into the Congo. Things are pretty bad. The 20th century sucks. Maybe the 21st will be better. I'm like, mm, I got some bad news for you, Ernie Hudson in Congo. So far, C-21's been a real bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> Ernie Hudson is going over everybody in the back of this Jeep, and he says, Laura Lenny, you have a good cover, but I don't know what you're doing here i only know that you don't spend the kind of money that you're spending to take a gorilla home he, he asked them what are you doing with that gorilla taking her back to the farm after she's seen the bright lights of gay patty mm. <laughs> it's like, what this cosmopolitan <laughs> city mouse of a monkey is going Dude, home he doesn't know where this monkey's been he's making a lot of presumptive statements here we cut to amy the gorilla she's sitting there squint-eyed sucking on this cigarello that i immediately thought that thing full of South American sense of me and laced with a bunch of high octane psychedelic hash oil. Amy leveled out. Amy feeling better. Amy want Taco Bell. Taco Bell. Cheesy fries. Cheesy fries. Stuffed crust pizza. None for you, ugly woman. You fat. You fat and ugly. Amy wonder why we're not in drive through Amy wonder what hold up is. Ernie Hudson calls out Laura Lenny saying, hmm, I'm guessing this gorilla is your cover for something more nefarious. And he's like, that's very clever, Laura Lenny. And then we cut to this other security point where everybody just gets arrested. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of screaming in this interrogation. And Dr. Peter, remember he's in this movie he's in this room and he's all worried about amy the gorilla as they're interrogating him no one's telling him where his intoxicated belligerent primate might be she's probably in another room spouting off something racist i would guess richard as he's being questioned by one dude what passes for a joke in this movie where he says Ugh. this is like kafka and the soldier is like who is this kafka yeah and you're like Ugh, all right who's that joke for <laughs> the cary grant crowd <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> cary grant and kafka i hit the jackpot this movie's got everything <laughs> The other thing is, Chad, we are on a rollicking jungle adventure as far as this movie goes. And all we're doing is going through checkpoints. Right. It's head scratching that at no point where in the production of this movie did somebody say, like, shouldn't all of this be fun? Shouldn't we be having a good time with all of this? No. Nope. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'll, I was yeah. just asking. Ernie Hudson, Tim Curry, and Laura Linney, they're taken to meet this warlord as played by Delroy Lindo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome back to Big Six Movies. He was running around as a detective in Gone in 60 Seconds back in season 10. I like Delroy Lindo a lot. He's really too good for this movie. But then again, so are some of the other actors in it. But <laughs> he's like, I want you all to have some coffee and cake. Have some cake! Tim Curry, have cake! And then Tim Curry starts to nibble on this brick of cake. And then Delroy Lindo calls out Laura Linney as being, you are a liar, liar, pants on fire. You are a former CIA agent. You are the one who blew up the president's car or something earlier yeah like, wait what so yes there is an indication that he knows because of this paper that he got handed she used to be in the cia now works for travelcom right and she says well it's because the money was better and he's like all right well bribe and just shouts out like you need to bribe me to continue right. and she gives him a stack of cash that could choke a pig right and then he's like okay you're good you can leave he does call out tim curry for being a sack of shit and 
says he owes everybody money. You need to get rid of him. And then, oh, and Laura Lenny elbows a guard in the dick to show that she's not a damsel in distress. But nothing comes of that. And he just, at one point, yells at Tim Curry for eating the sesame cake that he told him to, to eat? eat. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the whole scene. That is just like, okay, you're going to be good because no one wants to be seen being mean to a gorilla. So you're going to be good to get across the border. And then right? everybody's freed and they're they're good. Laura Linney feels like they were wanting to cast Laura Dern from Jurassic Park. There were a lot of movies like this. They all seem to be Michael Crichton inspired. Helen Hunt, you know, is going to show up a year later in Twister, mm -hmm. looking very much like Laura Linney and Laura Dern. You're not wrong. And well, speaking of Michael Crichton, isn't that a Michael Crichton join as well? Uh huh. This is another of those situations of like all the pieces of a good movie are here. It's just arranged in a terrible <laughs> dry sesame cake that no yeah. one could possibly care about i mean it's very much jurassic park as well but the other problem is we're going through all these checkpoints and hey remember that there were these crazy monkeys we saw at the beginning i don't remember any of that bo hell is amy the gorilla still in our movie we haven't seen her for a while none of this matters like all this checkpoint stuff and going through the weird politics of this who could possibly care about any of this but yeah so we're now we're back on the road going across the african savannah again they go through yet another checkpoint <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we do in this movie and then they pass some zebras and then they go to a smaller plane mm -hmm. and finally ernie hudson is just like oh by the way if you were curious we're now in tanzania audience and you're like uh okay i'll give you a million dollars and a thousand guesses to point out tanzania on a map <laughs> Uh, how many guesses a thousand oh like, all right i think i could get it at a thousand i'm not saying you i'm saying hey average joe idiot saying like we're in tanzania that's where bugs bunny met the tasmanian devil i'll bet like yeah that's where it was stupid <laughs> They get on this plane, and Ernie Hudson says, Tim Curry, you're not looking for the lost city of Zinj, are you? It doesn't exist. You're a lying Romanian who has only done good in the world for one person, and that's you, Tim Curry. And then Tim Curry says, shut up, you filthy, and the letter N just sits pursed on his lips before Tim Curry thinks better of himself and just keeps his racial slurs to his interior monologue. It's shocking that this movie takes this turn yeah is tim curry the bad guy or is he the comedic relief or is he a racist or is he all three i couldn't pin his character down at all the movie can't either is he just the silly wacky character and even at the end when he's supposed to be kind of at his most villainous he's not really a villain you know no. like he's not putting anyone else in danger he's just stupid yes which is why i felt that he tipped more towards comedic relief right. or buffoonery rather than nefarious monster but he is a racist if, yes about to drop the end bomb in this movie you're like <laughs> whoa tim curry and Bo, he's one of like three white people in this scene and there's like 50 people in the scene and he says i am sorry i am very testy after traveling. I remember that time I got real sleepy and became a racist. Totally. <laughs> sort of the side effects of NyQuil Z. Right. <laughs> it caused irritability, muscle cramps, and extreme racism. Do not operate heavy machinery <laughs> or talk to Jewish people. It's <laughs> just nuts. Everybody gets on this plane. It takes off. And then down below, some rogue militants in the jungle start firing off these heat-seeking rockets at the plane. This all sounds like it's thrilling, but it isn't. So they give Amy the Gorilla a banana with some drugs in it, which is the only way Amy the Gorilla will eat a banana. Amy like quaaludes. Amy like getting high. <laughs> Amy wants to watch Spongebob. Amy need bowl of cereal with cartoons. <laughs> All these rockets are being shot up at the plane, so it's decided that everybody must evacuate with parachutes. Laura Lenny steps up her badassery. She kicks open the plane's door, grabs a flare gun, fires it off into the sky to draw the fire of the heat-seeking rockets. Ernie Hudson sees this, and he says, By Jove, that chippy appears to be doing something heroic. I should get in on that act as well. Which he does. Mm-hmm. 
And so they just both shoot flare guns out the window for a second. But then they decide they got to jump out the door of the plane anyway. Uh Uh-huh. Ernie Hudson is like, you know, I'll strap the gorilla to me. I'll see what all the fuss is about with Dr. Peter. (laughs) He jumps out of this plane, bow with this drugged up gorilla strapped to his belly like a stuffed bear he won at the carnival. Mm -hmm. And all I wanted to see happen was Amy the gorilla to regain consciousness as they are tumbling towards Earth and just freaking out yeah that would have been something in this movie at least. <laughs> it's the ground with no jaw or genitals because that's how it works chad i don't know if i haven't been clear about that but that's how monkeys do tim curry tells one of the guys you're going to have to kick me out and so they do they kick him out and and then the the plane blows up as they all drift down to safety so what was the point of the flares i don't know there's no hero of this movie. It feels like everybody in the movie could possibly be the hero, but everyone just went not it at the same time. And therefore we have no real protagonist. There's no story arcs. Nobody learns anything. Nothing happens. Spoilers at the end of the movie. They just let Amy the gorilla loose in the jungle. And as you mentioned earlier, they fly off in a hot air balloon that apparently their paid help has been toting around for about a week in the jungle. I think the closest comparison or the one that they're going for at least is they're going for Jurassic Park but the difference is Jurassic Park doesn't have a central hero it has a number of heroes this has no heroes right like Jurassic Park because it's far 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 better written as a a film has a number of people thrust into an extreme circumstance and they all have these moments where they have to do something heroic and so everybody kind of gets a turn at it whether it's Laura Lenny going to get the power back on or the kids having to run away from the the velociraptors or sam neill saving the kids and the jeep falling all that stuff like everybody gets a turn yeah. and in this movie you want to do something heroic nope how about you uh-uh okay there's no th- ongoing threat like by the time you get to the monkeys spoilers everyone the gray apes in this movie that are kind of the the big mystery that we saw at the beginning they're in this movie for 10 minutes if that i mean it's a real blink and you'll miss it kind of situation so the movie just doesn't understand that's why people are there is not to see all of the geopolitics of africa and plane action we're here to see these apes and have an adventure through the jungle yeah this isn't a star wars prequel people come on right once they land on the ground dr peter goes over to ernie hudson and he says we have to call this off i'm in over my head like you ding dong you're in the middle of the jungle you're gonna call it off you're nowhere with no transportation this may be the stupidest thing ever said in a movie we've reviewed on this show ernie hudson at least has the good sense to be like well if you want to go then head any direction you like really but i'm taking (laughs) everyone to this mountain he's like uh i guess i'll go with you then dr peter he goes looking for amy the gorilla who's most likely off eating random berries to see if they'll get her back to even and then everybody just starts marching off in the jungle to go somewhere laura lenny has this tracking device that'll help her find bruce campbell maybe and they stop to make camp ernie hudson walks over to tim curry and he says tell me tim curry what's laura lenny doing here you know she's ex-cia what's she after what are you after king solomon's mind and all of his diamonds there were eight different subjects in that one series of questions which one would you like for me to take first yeah. tim curry decides to answer i pff, i'm not looking for any diamonds <laughs> and ernie hudson is just like nope not buying it i know you are you're a filthy filthy liar tim curry but back to laura lenny being a filthy filthy liar in the background dr peter is playing a game of grab ass with amy the gorilla i think this is all foreplay and he's like (laughs) tickling her ass and running around slapping her on the butt cheeks and richard the lab assistant comes over and he feeds amy some of her gruel and then laura lenny she gets on her satellite computer and she calls back to houston and she chats it up with joe don baker who tells laura lenny go find that laser and those diamonds and what's his name that guy you almost married he grew up my house also i had some of those images of that creature that we saw analyzed turns out it's something new it's it's like a gorilla but it's not a gorilla you probably should get a gun if one of those sons of bitches show up also i think you're near a volcano if it blows up you're probably gonna die in the movie's finale so take care all right bye-bye jdb over and out here's an unnecessary ticking clock for this movie see you later and then peter and amy run by and they knock over the satellite computer system breaking it and we get a cut to joe don baker just screaming god damn it i think that's just an outtake of him just talking on set naturally he gives a good god damn it not again that's quality (laughs) and laura lenny is like 
you stupid monkey and you stupid scientist. You broke all my stuff. The equipment's busted now. We have no way to contact yeah. Joe Don Baker. She's real pissed off, which is how you like her, Bo. I do. I like an angry Laura Linney. She's sassy. <laughs> it's night in the jungle. Peter wakes up to the sounds of a bunch of monkeys, as does Laura Linney. And this is the scene we were referencing earlier, where they come out of their tents and Ernie Hudson says, It's the full moon and these are Colobus monkeys. It's mating season. They're about to do it a lot. And yeah. Dr. Peter makes these kind of screeching sounds as he and Laura Lenny look at one another in a subplot that never materializes again of like well maybe agreed yeah maybe they're attracted to each other maybe they're not but again this movie doesn't seem to care so why should I the next morning rain starts to fall which if I was there I'd be like hey Amy the gorilla you're home now good luck Amy the gorilla mm -hmm. I brought you home now go teach those other monkeys how to talk or whatever it was that we were gonna do <laughs> bye <laughs> we get a scene where some nameless hired hand cuts off the head of a non-threatening snake then we cut to the next day and amy the gorilla gets up and she finds a toad to lick so that she can get high again and then she opens up this crate looking for bananas because amy clearly equates eating bananas with getting ripped out of her mind oh for sure amy loved banana amy liked tripping balls but <laughs> yeah so there's uh, some business with uh, like rain and tents and all that kind of stuff but when dr peter wakes up and and freaks out He's like, oh my God, you're not going to believe there's something on my penis. And Ernie Hudson says, <laughs> well, let's have a look. And so he kind of pulls his pants down a little bit. And Ernie Hudson says, that's a pubic hair. You're going through puberty, Dr. Peter. You're a man now. It's actually a leech. Didn't we just do this in Stand By Me? A leech on the dick. That's what, 10 years before? Stand By Me is like mid 80s, right? All right. Past the statute of limitations <laughs> on dick leech <laughs> jokes. As far as I'm concerned, there should be one movie every year that's got dick leeches. Look, I'm pro dick leech. I always have been. I always will be. Yeah, so Ernie Hudson hands him a, a cigar and is like, well, go burn it off. Yeah. And and Laura Linney is just straight up clowning on him. Yeah, she's mocking him. Laura Linney and mocking someone in pain goes together like Laura Linney and raising eyebrows disapprovingly. This is probably the most I was attracted to her in the movie where she's just <laughs> shaming him. Maybe that's my thing. Without saying any words. Peter sees over Laura Lenny's shoulder that there are now some guys from this ghost tribe we will learn some some natives just standing there they sneak up on him and he's like hey ernie hudson there's some dudes over there and ernie hudson says well if there are two that you see there are 20 that you don't and so ernie hudson talks to them and they speak in the uh, native language and ernie hudson is like huh well this is curious they say there's a dead white man in the jungle and then they draw a crazily accurate travel come logo in the dirt sure and laura linney is like hey that's a company i know that i work for <laughs> <laughs> And she says, wait, did you say that somebody was dead? And Ernie Hudson's like, well, yes, but they, he's mostly dead. Uh, they believe he said to blave, which, as we all know, means to bluff. <laughs> so he was probably caught in some sort of gambling accident. Basically, <laughs> they're taken to this ceremony where a uh, medicine man is yelling at this white dude, just laying in a corpse outline that you find at yeah. a crime scene. It's basically the African version of thoughts and prayers. Instead of it being Bruce Campbell, which would make a ton of sense it's just some dude named bob we've never seen before no <laughs> laura lee's like bob bob and you're like wait a second who is bob again oh nobody okay movie and then amy the gorilla staggers into the movie what are you guys doing here assholes and then bob the rando he starts screaming seeing a gorilla and then he just dies it is the most nothing of a scene in a series of nothing scenes it's shocking how little this matters to anything in the film yeah we cut to the crew inflating boats to go down river dr peter is grooming amy's fur with his fingertips and amy <laughs> has also been drugged again because nobody wants a gorilla high on jungle psychedelics in an inflatable raft and then amy again who is perpetually drunk high or doped up on pills in our movie for some reason as they're moving her to chunk her onto one of these inflatable floats they all start singing california dreaming by the beach boys acapella style in a better movie it would probably be a fun scene but uh, you don't know who any of these characters are and that's the thing like at a certain point th these characters just kind of run away oh this movie is so frustrating so then they go down some rapids which don't matter because nothing happens it's not even dangerous rapids <laughs> 
Yeah. It's like the kind of rapids you pay for 20 bucks a purse. You're like, well, how was it? It was all right. Yeah. yeah. It's like going down the Grizzly River rampage for those uh, Opryland folks listening. And so Ernie Hudson <laughs> is asking Tim Curry again about the city of Zinge. And he's like, look, there's no point playing coy, old man. I know where you're going and I know what you want. So just confess, confess. And Tim Curry finally comes clean and he's like, yes, we have a gorilla. And Amy knows where Lost City of Zinge is. She was painting pictures that match symbol of Lost City. She can get us there, assuming she can stay sober enough to put one foot in front of the other. I think she has problem. Uh, also, I found ring with same symbol. I kept it in hollow without book. Where's book? Laura Lenny's hand tracker loses its signal. I'm like, was that a bad thing? They ask her like, hey, does that mean somebody's dead? And she's like, nope, just lost the signal. Everything's cool, I'm sure. That's it. The stakes in this movie, are your as an audience you are constantly reminded in this film how little any of this matters yeah it's oh it's such a bad movie it's nighttime and our floating boats are on the water in the jungle and then we get a scene where a bunch of hippos attack the crew and they thin out the cast a little bit all this happens under the cover of darkness so you can't see anything you know what you needed in this scene, Chad, or before this scene? Is Ernie Hudson saying, hey, as we're traveling down this river, keep an eye out for hippos. Why, you ask? Because they are incredibly dangerous. I know hungry, hungry hippos and all that stuff and the Jungle Cruise ride and all that, but hippos are man-eaters. Right. And, like, just tell us why we should be afraid of them so when these hippo puppets show up we're not like oh hippos like why are they eating people i thought they ate lettuce or those white balls yeah so the remaining crew survives after letting a few people get sacrificed to the hippos they make it to the shore and then up in the sky we see a plane on fire headed towards earth to crash and you're like what's that doesn't matter okay even more importantly the ne- we cut to the next day and the crew that wasn't eaten by the hippos they make their way towards a volcano dr peter says hey on the other side of this mountain is where amy the gorilla was born and then we abducted her and we taught her sign language and how to paint and we helped to facilitate a crippling addiction to alcohol and <laughs> drugs both prescription and street tim curry says she wants to go to place in her heart and you're like what okay and finally ernie hudson lets him know like hey we've had some people run away at this point and they come to a fork in the jungle i guess right <laughs> ernie hudson is like well we can go left or we can go right if we go left it's going to take us two more days but if we go right it's super dangerous or something so amy the gorilla seems to want to go left and so they follow the gorilla also amy the gorilla has not been using her als super nintendo power glove that much so richard the lab assistant which you're like where has he been for the last hour of our movie apparently just right out of the shot of the camera richard shows up and he puts the yakety yak device back on amy the gorilla and and here Amy says, Amy say go this way. Amy know which way to go. Mm-hmm. Amy think you need to go to rehab. Amy tired of your judgment. Amy also could use a drink. You don't know Amy. Uh. <laughs> Amy don't know Amy. <laughs> so we get more walking through the jungle. Then we get a roar and a full size silverback gorilla shows up to confront our movie's cast of characters. And the gorilla goes up and just bows up on Dr. Peter who just cowers his head in subservience. And then the gorilla just just runs off and leaves and we cut to ernie hudson and the rest of the crew and they have all run off and hid in fear and ernie hudson's character admits well when the gorilla showed up i filled my pants with urine and then i found a safe place behind that rock hoping that he would kill you dr peter and would be too tired to come after me why should i do anything heroic at all in this film also amy seems real bummed out by the fact that she tried talking to these gorillas that charged and they were just like Uh, uh, screw you and then took off she says to him hi i'm amy i'm good good amy i like bananas and drugs and booze and more drugs and she's wearing this translator glove which is the equivalent of outer dental headgear for a monkey all these gorillas just shun amy as they should one of the gorillas shouts out nerd and then they all leave to go throw rocks at trains as they pass by amy wonder if you have connection amy need hookup amy starting (laughs) to get shakes laura lenny 
rolls up on Dr. Peter at this point and is like, boy, she just doesn't belong anywhere, does she? I kind of respect that about her. And Peter's like, no, no, no. She belongs here. She also said you're really ugly. And she <laughs> said your ass smells like your breath or your breath smells like your ass. I can't remember which one she said first, but you definitely have ass breath, <laughs> according to Amy. That's not me. That's Amy talking. Then they stumble over a trip wire for the perimeter alarm for the original camp that Bruce Campbell and his buddies had. Yeah. And find a bunch of wreckage left behind, but there's no sign of any bodies. Yeah, they're all dead. So they just keep going? One of the hired hands goes into this tiny cave. Why? Doesn't matter. And then he pops his head out and he goes, bingo! Remember when Cousin Eddie said that? <laughs> bingo! In yeah, that, I... <laughs> that vacation movie? That's a piece of shit. And I stand mm. by that. Is it better or worse than Congo? If I had to watch Christmas Vacation or watch Congo, uh-huh. Ooh. Yeah, it's a real devil's bargain. I would go Christmas vacation. I think that's probably right. Yeah. This conversation represents the last time I will think about the movie Congo. I hope so. You and me both. The real fear at this point is that you get trapped under something on one of those afternoons where TNT is like, we're going to play Congo 37 times in a row. And your brain just starts eating itself. Uh, yeah. I would go Christmas vacation because I would rather watch a movie with Beverly D'Angelo in it than a movie with Laura Linney in it. Mm, see, now that you phrase it like that. I know. I did that on purpose for you. <laughs> that's a little <laughs> tough because I love Beverly D'Angelo as well. I know. <laughs> oh, boy. That's a, that's a real Sophie's choice. <laughs> You can't ask me to choose one of my kids. I love them equally for different reasons. I'm going to have to think about that. Like, I'm going to have to put <laughs> pen to paper before I can give you an answer on that. <laughs> so everybody goes down in this little bingo hole and they find this small creek and they march, march through it. And everyone's shoes gets filled with water. I can't imagine my socks and boots being filled with this muck. That's got to suck. Mm -hmm. There's more walking through the jungle till finally, Bo, they find the lost city of Zing. And Tim Curry says, I have looked for this my whole life. Look, the ring from my book matches the eyes on the statue and this set piece looks like the abandoned set of nickelodeon's legend of the hidden temple game show it looks like garbage and also they cut to amy who looks scared or bored or just jonesing when she <laughs> sees the statue with the eye hard to tell because it's a fake monkey <laughs> Kermit the Frog emoted more than Amy the Gorilla in this. Yes, that's fair. And that was like a sock puppet. Like, this thing had to have cost tens of thousands of dollars, and you get nothing. There was a whole thing, I didn't put it in the introduction because it's not that interesting, but there was a whole thing where, the, like, they had different heads to express different emotions, and it's like, eh, you didn't pull it off. And I kind of side with Stan Winston a little bit, who really said, like, the direction of this movie didn't do the character of Amy any favors or any of the monkeys that there's a way to shoot this stuff that like steven spielberg knows how to shoot puppets because spoilers there are no actual dinosaurs in jurassic park a lot of them are puppets <laughs> but steven spielberg knows how to cheat the shots and use the lighting to his advantage to help obscure some of that stuff so that they, it looks scary and real and all of that frank marshall it, you know <laughs> not so much yeah right ernie hudson in this movie he's wearing this beige zip up work suit and in this scene here he's wearing a black backpack and he's carrying a machine gun and he 100 percent looks like he is in a hastily thrown together Winston Zeddemore Halloween costume <laughs> in southern Louisiana. Tim Curry then <laughs> just starts to get a villainous look in his eye for no reason. Hmm. And where he's like, city was built around the mine and the gods here were legendary for savagery. And then suddenly flow of diamonds stop. And then one of the men from Ernie Hudson's crew finds a Hershey bar wrapper and Laura Linney is like, Bruce Campbell, we got to get inside. And Ernie Hudson stops her and is like, listen, I'm afraid you can't go alone. Come to think of it, I shouldn't go alone either. Here, take this gun. You go first. I'll be behind you. If you don't hear me, trust me, I'm behind you. Just quite a few paces back. Yeah. Scream if you get killed and I'll run and get help. Richard the assistant, Amy, and another dude wait outside while everybody else goes inside the lost city of Zinge to investigate. Amy the gorilla stays outside. And Tim Curry sees some hieroglyphics on the walls as they go inside and he's like, I don't know what this means. I can't decipher them, but maybe later in movie when it won't matter. So there's a 
quick cutaway outside where Richard is asking his guard, Claude, like, hey, so your name's Claude? That seems weird. Where are you from? And Claude's like, Mombasa. And he's like, huh, it's a weird name for somebody from Mombasa. And he goes, hmm, do you know anyone from Mombasa or have you ever been to Mombasa? And he's like, uh, no. And the guard's like, uh-huh. I'm gonna go have a smoke somewhere else. I'll give you a million dollars if you can find Mombasa on the map. And I'm gonna give you a thousand guesses. Also, <laughs> bonus points for Tanzania. Right, you idiot. So Richard, the assistant, realizes that Amy has gone wandering. Looking to score. Looking for anybody that is standing on a street corner in the jungle. <laughs> So he gets got, presumably, by one of these gray apes that you see in a quick flash. It's immediate. Like, yeah. there's something stalking him, and then he's done. And so then we go back inside the city where Ernie Hudson is pointing out these lava tubes. They're all smoking everything. And Tim Curry, meanwhile, is just looking for, I need to find passage to mines. And then <laughs> Richard, the assistant, runs into the ruins. Yeah, and then a gray ape shows up at the entrance and throws a head at Tim Curry. And at first I was like, wait, whose head is that? Oh, that's Claude. Okay, the character that we never saw encounter one of these things. And the whole movie goes into this super slow motion. It's almost like a random frame by frame storyboard in a way. It's terrible. Man. The slow motion is of a stripe that I really don't like because it really obscures what you're trying to see. Yeah. Because I think if they showed it in regular motion, you'd be like, well, this looks terrible. But again, it's just, there's a way to shoot this so that it is kind of like creepy and weird, but we're just never going to get there with Frank Marshall. Amy the gorilla shows up to hang out with our movie's remaining characters. Dr. Peter says, hey, I think that was a gorilla. Thank goodness you're here, Amy. Tim Curry says, the myth of the killer ape is true. The what of the killer what is what? When did that get introduced into our movie? Briefly on the plane, somebody said something about something, but... I don't know. Everybody puts bullets in their machine guns, and they set up a perimeter outside. Tim Curry hides in a nylon tent because he's a real dummy. And then Amy the Gorilla says bad gorillas amy no like gorillas those gorillas are assholes and our heroes of the movie they've set up these automatic machine guns that will fire at anything if it approaches the perimeter it's all very video game ish mm -hmm. there's this scene where we hear them go off and these barely seen gray apes are kind of running around in the jungle and the guns are shooting and there are lasers I'll, like some kind of crazy futuristic laser grid that yeah. burns the apes when they get too close and i was like why not just use more of those that seems to be effective as the gorillas approach laura lenny and the team they can see the gorillas on predator vision mm -hmm. where there are these colored outlines detecting the heat of the mean gorillas bodies and there's all quick cuts of machine gun fire and red and orange flashes in the night none of this means anything because the movie is terribly dull and then the bad gorillas just leave ernie hudson is the smartest person in the movie because he says we are getting out of here at first light tim curry comes out of his tent and he says the hieroglyphics we saw in the cave i have translated them they say mm -mm, we are watching you or maybe they say we like to watch you have sex it's one or the other i cannot say which speaking of dr peter can i watch what you and ape do well i don't know what you're talking about what, you what know, are you implying you we know, don't do anything you no, know, no. don't play coy with me i know i've been around the world <laughs> I did not fall off turnip truck yesterday, Dr. Peter. The next morning, Amy the gorilla tries to make some friends with normal gorillas without her nerd gear glove on. And the normal gorillas accept Amy, kind of. And we cut over to Ernie Hudson. He's walking through the jungle, hoping he doesn't accidentally do something heroic. And then the remaining members of our movie, they go back into the temple because this movie is poorly directed and edited. Mm -hmm. Laura Lenny gives Dr. Peter a gun and Dr. Peter says, oh, I don't like guns. And Laura Lenny says, like, I don't care if you don't like guns. Just take it, you worthless man. Oh, and I'm like, oh that's some sweet emasculation from Laura Lenny. <laughs> yeah, that's the good <laughs> stuff. Her exact line is, I didn't ask you if you liked them. It's like, oh, man, that sounds like she's making me dinner. <laughs> I don't really care for escargot. I didn't ask you if you liked it. <laughs> yeah, I said that's what we were having tonight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what? 
inside the temple. <laughs> Dr. Peter sees some bones and he says, hey, those are bones of normal gorillas. I think the asshole gorillas were killing normal gorillas. And then we get a little more earthquake shaky cam. Tim Curry just shows up out of nowhere and he says, I'm glad they found you. I was looking for the diamonds and wasn't on the call sheet for last two days of filming. Let's continue through movie, shall we? We get one cutaway to Amy grabbing her power glove backpack thing and so she is on the move now our heroes question mark find this cavern with a bunch of sulfur springs and there's no roof to the place and tim curry is like the mines there's all this sand with these potato sized diamonds laid on top it looks like an easter egg hunt he sees a bunch of diamonds and just grabs one off the ground and kisses it uh. which is giving him something that it's not a disease-free diamond. <laughs> Fill your pockets. Let's get rich, bitches. And then there's some growling from these holes in the walls. Uh-oh. Dr. Peter is like, I think you should probably leave all those diamonds alone. And sure enough, like all these monstrous gray apes are just kind of creeping around, looking yeah. over rocks and stuff, and like... Hey, are they stealing? Are they in our house stealing diamonds? That's really screwed up, man. All the characters that aren't Tim Curry, they just start shooting at these asshole gorillas. And then more asshole gorillas show up. There's more gunshots. More gorillas just start beating up all of these people. Random hired hands get killed so our movie's main characters can make it to the end of the film. Dr. Peter and Laura Lenny, they wander around and they find some human bones where they come across the corpse of Bruce Campbell laying on a pile of <laughs> other bones. Bones. And this Bruce Campbell body really looks like a shitty wax museum statue of Bruce Campbell. Like when you see it and the nameplate says Bruce Campbell, but you're like, really? That's Bruce Campbell? Yeah, it's not great. They also find his buddy Jeffrey he was looking for, so, you know. Good for them. I'm just glad that one plot in this movie resolves itself. <laughs> there's more earthquake rumbles. There's more gunfire. Laura Lenny fills up the laser gun that Bruce Campbell had earlier in the movie with some diamond juice to defend herself. Dr. Peter, he gets pulled into the Temple of Gorilla Doom to be killed by the asshole gorillas. And then Amy the gorilla just shows up on a ledge and says, ugly, ugly gorillas, go away. And then the asshole gorillas just run off. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And Ernie Hudson is like, well, they don't know what to make of her. And I'm like, they probably ran into her when she was trying to score earlier. And they were like, we just need to go lock all the doors and windows. Otherwise, she's going to steal all the DVD players to try to sell them. Whatever you do, do not co-sign a loan for Amy the gorilla. Right. She's going to tell you that she's in, in treatment, but... But she is not in treatment. Laura Liddy jumps up and she has this laser gun and she just starts like proton packing these asshole gorillas, <laughs> blasting them with this red laser that just bisects primates like a hot knife through butter. Yeah. And then both the volcano just starts belching out lava and it's incinerating these asshole gorillas one by one. And these asshole gorillas, dude, they just cannonball into the lava below like it's caddy day at Bushwood Country Club. Dude, this is the thing i remember most from this movie is how ridiculous this moment in particular is when you're like this is just nonsense the end of this movie is the supposed villains of the film just jumping into their deaths into lava Ernie Hudson, Laura Lenny, Dr. Peter, and Amy the Gorilla, they make their escape as the ground pitches to and fro and red hot magma pours across the ground. I cannot express how unthrilling all of this is. Long story short, everybody escapes and Dr. Peter sets Amy free into the jungle. Peter, Amy, Ernie Hudson, and Laura Lenny escape. Well, yeah. And yeah, so they let Amy free and then Laura Lenny is like, oh, you remember that plane that went down? And Ernie Hudson is like, I think I do. And she's like, you remember you son of a bitch and he's like hmm i find that strangely attractive Laura Lenny. <laughs> apparently they had a hot air balloon packed up on this plane that got shot down and that package is fine i thought they mentioned the hot air balloon with joey pants earlier no he said he couldn't get one Oh, okay. And and All so right. that's why I guess she knew that it was in the other plane. I wish they had had jetpacks in there as opposed to a hot air balloon. And they just like blast off like the rocketeer at the end. It's real stupid. She calls up Joe Don Baker on yeah. some technology that's just sitting around. And Laura Lenny says, did you send me here to save your son? You know, my ex fiance and the grotesquely underutilized in this movie, Bruce Campbell. Or did you send me here just to get diamonds for your laser communication satellite business plan? 
cash cow scheme. And Joe Don Baker says, did you get the diamonds? And she says, do you remember when I told you I was going to make you suffer if I thought for one second that I wasn't here to get Bruce Campbell and not your stupid diamonds? Do you remember me saying that? I was too busy smashing monitors with my golf clubs. Mm. Well, how do you like this? I can use this laptop to find the coordinates of the satellite and then use my but, laser but, that I used to but, kill monkeys with but, my special monkey laser. <laughs> but you, don't you, you can't. And then she blows it up. She pulls a reverse real genius and blows up the satellite in space with a laser beam. I hate to nitpick, but if I don't, Todd is going to be honest about this. Actually, a reverse real genius would be using popcorn to blow up the satellite. I, I gotta tell you, Todd has been chirping in my ear this entire episode, and I've ignored all of his comments. <laughs> It's probably smart. Mm -hmm. Ugh, Todd. Stupid Todd. Dr. Peter says goodbye to Amy, the drug-addicted, alcoholic gorilla. She goes off into the wild to detox and make the lives of all the normal gorillas a living hell on Earth. And then, yeah, Dr. Peter, Ernie Hudson, and Laura Lenny get into a hot air balloon, and they just fly off into the sky as this volcano erupts below the end. Well, Laura Lenny has Dr. Peter throw the diamond that she took as a super veneer away uh-huh then when he does it she's like that was a terrible throw yeah and he's like oh you, you, you're not... weak you weak weak man i should have thrown it myself <laughs> yeah you should have i should have gotten a make a wish child to throw it for me also the last line of this movie is dr peter saying well now that we're up here in this hot air balloon i sure hope it blows us someplace good and ernie hudson is like yeah me too and then that's it <laughs> This was the number one movie at the box office when it opened. They yeah. really duped people into thinking this was going to be Jurassic Park with gorillas. And it is not. It made a lot of money. I gave them money. I saw it in the theater like a jackass. <laughs> yeah, that was wrong. It, it's crazy to me, A, that this movie was a success because it's terrible. But B, it's like, how do you screw this up? This seems a, another movie that feels kind of like a slam dunk. And they just get it all wrong, which just goes to show that even when you have all the theoretical pieces in plays it is real easy to make a movie that just is terrible and yeah. and congo is congo is a truly truly bad film when we review such a bad movie as this is, I think you need a palate cleanser. And to cleanse your palate, Bo, I think you should go back to the basics. And on our next episode, we are going to go back to the basics with the very first movie that Michael Crichton ever directed, Westworld. A movie that asks, hey, what if you could have sex with and murder robots <laughs> that look like humans? And then what if the robots thought that plan sucks? Oh, I like all of this. We've got uh, Josh Brolin's dad is in it. Yul Brenner, the king of the king and I himself. Dick Van Patten from Eight is Enough. He's showing up. And I'm sure we're going to spend a little bit of time trying to figure out how Richard Benjamin became a movie star. If Saturday the 14th isn't enough to convince you. I don't know what is. Yeah, the, <laughs> and Dick Van Patten plays a robot king, if I remember that right. He's not a robot king. He's a visitor to the park itself, but he's just kind of a dimwit. Okay, well, that tracks. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's a good time. Westworld inspired the popular, questionably good uh, HBO series. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw the first season and then when uh, Anthony Hopkins checked out, so did I. But it's an interesting, entertaining, and I, I would say very well-directed movie that just has some story problems. I think my, as we go through this season, I think we're going to see some themes of Michael Crichton's books and films that repeat themselves over and over as we continue forward. One thing that you and I have discussed previously is the inability of Michael Crichton to end a story. Yeah. And Congo is exhibit A of that, where a bunch of monkeys just jump into lava. In fairness, Mel Brooks movies have the same problem. Uh-huh. And I think that Douglas Adams, as a writer, suffered the same fate in many of his books. Great beginnings, wonderful middles, terrible endings. Yeah. Stephen King has some of those problems as well. It, it's yeah. 
enough, yeah. it, it's easy to, the beginning of a story is great, the middle of the story is where you get to have fun, and then trying to tie it all together is the hard part yeah. in, a, in a satisfying way. And there are some people who are really good at it, some people not so much. And I think Crichton is of that ilk, and, and not alone, for sure, of, of people that maybe are not great about putting a bow, for lack of a better term, on their films. Or Chad. Or Chad. They, there are very few Chads in Michael <laughs> Crichton works, and that's a problem. So if you have a recommendation for this season, we are still finalizing the final four episodes of this sextet. So you can email us at picksixmovies at gmail.com. As always, like, rate, review, tell a friend. You can reach out to us on social media. We're floating around here and there. We do our best to respond to everybody who reaches out to us. And we always love to hear from you and hear what you like and don't like about the show. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on the film Congo? Other than to say this is the last time I will see Congo, and that is absolutely a good thing. Yeah. Amy want to go sleep now. Amy tired. Not before you take me to the city of Zinj. We'll see you in two weeks time, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.